Lenore Coleman, president and founder of Healing Our Village, and the executive director of Total Lifestyle Change, which is my nonprofit organization. Welcome to For Your Health. I'm so glad that you're tuning in today. Um, this is a, a new program we just started, and uh, every month we're going to be focusing on topics for that month, and, and February is Heart Month. And so I decided for the month of February, we're going to be bringing you some of the medical experts and pharmacist experts throughout the country to talk to you about heart disease. Now, many of you know that Healing Our Village has been doing this business for a long, long time, and that personally, I have a passion to stop hypertension. There is no reason that African Americans should be dying of hypertension in 2021. We have a, a, a whole plethora of medications that work really, really well. We know so much more about diet and exercise. We know so much more about how to cope with stress and anxiety. Um, we have blood pressure monitors now that are Bluetooth enabled so that you could get one of those monitors and I could actually see your blood pressure and what it was, and we could work together to get your blood pressure under control. So I decided to kick off our first episode this month, Heart Month, with a discussion about hypertension or high blood pressure. And we are honored, and I am so excited that I was able to get Dr. Wallace Johnson, all right, from the University of Maryland, he actually runs the, the hypertension program there at the University of Maryland. He's an associate professor at the university, but he's also head of the, the cardiology section for the National Medical Association. And you're going to hear me talk about the National Medical Association a lot as we do our programs. It is one of the longest standing only African-American medical associations here in this country. There's also, of course, the Association of Black Cardiologists, but they were actually came from the National Medical Association. So those organizations have some of the leading black physicians and researchers here in the United States. They also do a lot of global health as well. So I work closely with the National Medical Association, and every time I get an opportunity to bring you one of the physicians that I know of that are part of that organization, you can believe I'm bringing them to you. And so today, again, we're honored to have Dr. Wallace Johnson. Dr. Johnson, how you doing, hello, sir? Hello, so glad hello, to have everyone you. there. Hello, everyone out there. That's I'm right. so happy to be here, and I'm so happy that you let everybody know that actually it's been since 1895. The National Medical Association has been established as an organization for people of the affluent diaspora and basically acting as advocates as well as educators for both physicians and the public at large when it comes to issues relating to health. So For Your Health is a perfect forum for the NMA, for myself. I thank you so much, Dr. Coleman, for having me on. And we, I can have to give some accolades back to my host and say she's been on the advocate on the forefronts, in the trenches, and out there getting it done for more years than I can remember. In fact, one of my favorite articles I still have a copy of is when she wrote an article about cardiology, how it related to diet, and things of that nature. So I still have that article, believe it or not, in okay. my own material. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, NMA is, is you know, I've been working with the organization for years, plan to continue mm -hmm. to work. And uh, this whole concept of For Your Health sort of sprung mm -hmm. out of my desire to be able to uh, 
um, you know, get the word out. You know, we're just scratching Fantastic. the surface in terms mm -hmm. of education and changing people's understanding of the health disparities that are affecting, you know, minority populations. Uh, you know, as mm -hmm. you know, I'm a, I've, I'm a pharmacist by training, but I'm also a, a diabetes educator. And we've been doing right. so much of that over the last, uh, um, you know, uh, 40 years of my career. I've been at this, believe it or not, I'm an old lady, 40 years. Mm. So, oh, you know, no, I you think look that great. this no, now, you look great. because you look we're like partnering you take with yourself. NMA, but also um, blackdoctors.org mm. that has 2 million mm. followers, then now I will be able to get this message out to so many more people than yes, we were before. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's All gonna be right. good. So we're gonna dive on in here today. We're gonna be talking about high blood pressure, also known as hypertension. So Fantastic. what exactly is hypertension? Okay, sure. Well, let's first define everything. Hypertension, you, number one, you don't have to be hyper to have hypertension. I try to get that myth out of the way very quickly. But hypertension is an elevation in blood pressure, which tends to bring about a change in your body that's detrimental to your body. For example, um, we're going to be talking about numbers, I know, in just a second. So to give you um, specific numbers, you want to think about a blood pressure level that's above the recommended level by consensus of groups that understand that certain cutoff numbers bring about a higher risk of damage to your heart lungs, you know, brain, kidney, et cetera. So in terms of thinking about the numbers, first of all, let's get the numbers straight. The top number, remember, is your systolic or when your heart is actually squeezing. And then that bottom number, your diastolic, is when the heart is quote unquote in between contractions or squeezes, if you will. That's important because a lot of people forget the fact that the heart needs blood too. And doing the lower number, when the number drops down to 80, 90, whatever the number may be, that's when the heart's actually getting its own blood. So you can't make the vital number go too low because then the heart won't get its own blood. So basically, when we think about the definition of hypertension, let's go to the definition for a second, where we say the top number when it's greater than 130 or the vital number when it's greater than 80, is that's the cutoff number to remember for the day. That's important because remember the old number we thought more about 140 over 90 right. than we did about 130 over 80. So now we're talking about 130 over 80, which brought about some controversy. And by the way, the National Medical Association had to sign off on the guidelines to say that we were going to be part of the consensus group that endorsed the guidelines. If you want to take a wild guess who signed off on, all you have to do is look at your screen. I was the one who signed off in the National Medical <laughs> okay, Association. You're the guy. Say, it was okay. I was the guy, right? So I guess um, you know, anybody, doctors out there, whatever, the man with me for making the number lower, I guess they have to come on the line and address it. But in any event, what I wanted to mention was 130 over 80 was a new number. Now, the other thing that they did that was very important, uh, that we did, I should say, that was very important, was we've been to say the 130 over 80 is a number we're going to try to use and try to extrapolate that over many different subgroups of populations. One of the things that became confusing before is you would say, well, if you had this group that had diabetes and heart disease, you use this number. If you had this other group that didn't have diabetes, and didn't have heart disease, you use this other number. And people are getting very confused. Right. So we simply said, we tried to make it simple based on some clinical trials we looked at. And we said 130 over 80 was the number to remember. Try to stay a little below that as long as, again, you feel okay. We always tell people all the time that guidelines and Dr. Google do not replace your doctor. Okay. Yeah, so exactly. keep in mind, whenever you're seeing guidelines and whenever you're seeing numbers to remember, that still doesn't replace your doctor's judgment. Right. And also right, the right. other thing that became very important to keep in mind was that when they used the term elevated blood pressure. So it used to be when you had a blood pressure between 120 and 129, it wasn't called elevated. Now we're calling that elevated blood pressure. Now people say, well, why is that? And that's because you get a benefit when you go from 130 down to say 119. So in other words, the concept of thinking of, oh, well, if my blood pressure is anything that's quote unquote, and I hate this four letter word that's used all the time. My blood pressure is fine, right? These fine blood pressures were killing a lot of people. A lot of people were saying, oh, my blood pressure is fine. And they were right. having all kinds of complications. So if we want to get that four letter word out. Please don't let you, anybody leave the doctor's office anymore saying my blood pressure was fine. 
write down and know your number. There's no other exactly. message I get across today. It's please write down and know your number. So, so we got to keep in mind, again, that 130 over 80 is an important number to remember. But go ahead. Yeah, let me ask you a question to, to not to cut you off because you just know so sure, much. Sure, we want you to come in with questions, yes. Yeah, okay, so... Um, you know that. So the, as you just said, we went down, went down from 140 over 90 to 130 over 80. But one of right. the things that really struck me when I went to Africa and I went to mm -hmm. Kenya and we went out and saw uh, the Maasai tribe. And what we okay. found is when we took their blood pressures, their blood pressures were 90 over 60. So mm -hmm. I tell patients all the time that from there are Africans, right, where which is where we descend from, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. their blood pressures aren't 120 over 80. Their blood pressures mm -hmm. are actually 90 over 60. And that's important mm -hmm. because African Americans, and we're going to talk about why that is, but African Americans' mm -hmm. pressures are higher, and which is why yes. we see so much heart disease and kidney disease and mm -hmm. and especially kidney and sort of your small vessel diseases because we can't handle that high pressure even 120 over 80 yes. still might be too high for us right right that's a good point i'm glad you mentioned kenya by the way if you go back to some old information that came out many years ago where dr neil polto i think it's, i believe his name was but in any event they had a tribe which moved from rural Kenya to Nairobi, Kenya, which, of course, is the largest city. And guess what happened when they moved into Nairobi, Kenya? Because of some political unrest, their blood pressures went up. Yep. Now, what happened when they moved from Nairobi, Kenya, back to rural Kenya again? When they were back in rural Kenya, farm side Kenya, if you will, the blood pressures began to drift back down, back to where they were before. Exactly. So we know that there's a big contributor between stress living in difficult environments that you're unfamiliar with and that you're unaccultured, not cultured to, if you will. And therefore, as a result, we know that that can change. That's why we actually signed off. We wanted to try to think of the lower number being better. And in many cases, we can achieve it, but we're going to have to change our frame of mind and we're going to have to change society's viewpoint about health in general. And we know that's something You've been working on for many years too, Dr. Cole. Yeah, exactly. Now, let me ask the question. So can your top number, your systolic pressure be high and your bottom number be low? And, and if that happens, does that mean you have hypertension? Talk to us about that. Yes. Well, first of all, keep in mind that the number, the 130 over 80 means if you have a blood pressure, let's say, for example, 160 over 70, you still have hypertension. Just because your bottom number is less than 80 doesn't mean that 70 gets you out. Now, who would have a blood pressure 160 over 70, for example? Patients who tend to have what? Older, stiffer vessels. Right. And people who have older, stiffer vessels tend to be older in age. So, for example, by the time people hit 75, we sometimes call it the 60-70 rule or the 70-70 rule. In other words, around 70% of people are going to have high blood pressure if they're over 70 or over which means that that group is gonna have a large number of people who are classified into what we call the isolated systolic hypertension group, meaning your top number is high, even though your bottom number may be normal or low. So, and that means the blood vessels tend to be older, stiffer, and unfortunately that blood pressure is a little bit harder to treat. So you really have to work even closely with your primary care or your specialist provider in terms of how you're gonna get that blood pressure down and get it down safely. Which exactly, is important as well. Exactly. Now, uh, somebody asked me this question and I didn't know the answer. Does it matter which arm I take the blood pressure in? Do I, should I use the right arm or the left arm? If I have the preference, which one should I use? Well, I got to put on my other hat for just a quick second. The other hat that I wear, we have a Center for Aortic Disease. And one of the things that's being a uncovered menace, and I'm seeing it more and more, unfortunately, in the African American patients, because Baltimore has a large African American population, which is where I'm from is that a lot of people are having aortic dissections or tearing of the aorta, which many times is blood pressure mediated. And also a lot of them have aortic aneurysms. Now, one of the different reasons why you can get a big difference in one arm versus the other is because of something like a problem with the aortic blood vessels, if you will. So we always tell my patients, it's a real simple thing to follow. Again, take home message. Take home message, always check both arms. If one arm tends to be higher than the other, number one, you want to share that with your physician. And number two, you want to be aware of that because you don't want to, quote, unquote, always take it in just the good arm because the one that's higher tends to be the one we target. 
So it does oh. make a difference. And I tell people if the one arm is higher than the other, I'm going to have a tendency to target the higher arm because why? If I target the higher arm, I automatically take care of the other arm simultaneously. Oh. See, that's, so that's a good question. I'm glad I asked you that question. See, because yes, I don't that's think a big people, one. That's people a really don't big know one. to do that. Okay, this is good. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there's something called white coat syndrome, and I found it to yes. be really interesting. The, the latest set of guidelines really did a nice explanation of what that was all about. Um, could you tell Definitely. us about what white coat syndrome actually is? Right. Well, of course, the name, let's go back to the original name first. Most doctors wear white coats, or many times wear white coats in their practice. So people will come into the doctor's office and have a high blood pressure that would be elevated, but then they would go back home and their blood pressure would be totally normal. So what that means is when they said people, when doc, they used to say, we used to use the pressure when maybe we need to get blue coat types to joke with my patients all the time. Yeah. Because every time people would see the white coat in the doctor's office, it seems like it would add another 10 points or five points or whatever onto their blood pressure reading. So if your blood pressure readings are high in the doctor's office, but not high at home, one of the take home messages is that does not mean you sit on your hands and go, oh boy, oh joy, I know that I'm okay because every time I take my blood pressure at home, I don't get a high reading. That means you just need to be ever vigilant and you need to watch out and make sure by way of looking at your heart, maybe say for example, with an EKG or by way of looking at your blood test, your laboratory results. If your numbers are out of whack indicating possibly that a white coat hypertension is affecting your body, then just like anything else, you have to figure out a way to address it. Exactly, exactly. So that's why I tell people, and we'll talk about this later, it's important to have your blood pressure cuff so you can take your own blood pressure at home. Exactly. And I usually tell people to take it at 8 o'clock at night and after, the, you know, after the kids are in bed and you're kind of relaxing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that would give a good index. Because if your blood pressure is high at that time of the day, can you imagine mm -hmm. how high it is when your boss just yelled at you, when you're late to work, mm -hmm. when you have right. a, a new assignment added on to you that you didn't expect, and so so that's exactly. why I think it's important. And we'll talk some more about that. But before mm -hmm. we get there, I want to talk about why is it that African-Americans have the highest rate of hypertension in the world? What, what, what's going on? And I know it's something with genetics, um, salt sensitivity, and environmental mm -hmm. factors. So I wanted to have you kind of talk a little bit about at least sure. some of those three things. Right. So well, let's, let's kind of start at the beginning. Yeah, let's start out with genetics. Well, first of all, genetics of hypertension is very difficult, uh, if you will, monster to grapple with because of the fact that blood pressure, as we know it, usually comes about from multiple factors. I know we're going to get into this later. Because it's caused by multiple factors, people take what? Multiple medications to treat a disease that has multiple factors that cause it. We're going to get into that a little bit later. But the bottom line is that from the genetic standpoint, the main genetic if you want to call it predispositions that we seem to find that seem to tease themselves out. And by the way, if you ever talk to a geneticist, they'll tell you it's very difficult to take a disease like hypertension and tease out a particular gene that supposedly is quote unquote the cause. Because again, as you just mentioned, the environment, stress, diet, all these other things could have a factor in it too. So just to blame it on one thing, like a gene can sometimes be very difficult in and of itself. But when you do find genetic predispositions toward high blood pressure, it seems to probably be from some standpoint or another, a gene affecting some standpoint of the kidney function. It seems to be where you're gonna have the highest yield when you start talking about genetically based hypertension. Now, the second issue you mentioned was the salt sensitivity. Yeah. Now, many of you have already heard about, this is Black History Month, so we certainly gotta talk about this. Many of you certainly have heard about the Middle Passage. What was the Middle Passage? The Middle Passage was coming from Africa into the United States of America and that slaves who could hold on to salt better, which means they would have a predisposition to being able to survive better with small amounts of water, would go on and survive. Those who couldn't survive with small amounts of water would die and get thrown off the ship and never make it to America. And so their gene pool never came here. So as a result, we kind of selected out, quote unquote, Africans who came over on the ship. Now, there's a lot of evidence to dispute that. And it's always been controversial, meaning that, again, go back to what I talked about a minute ago, Nairobi, Kenya, just moving from rural to urban Nairobi, Kenya, brought about an increase in blood pressure as well. So there's probably a little bit of all of the above being true, but bottom line is that from the standpoint of salt sensitivity, a lot of African Americans tend to have a large amount of salt sensitivity, more so than many other ethnic groups, 
And there's, um, think, a variety of factors that cause that. But all of that says to us in terms of what we need to remember today, the most important thing to know is to know that your sodium intake is important and understand that when you read a label on a can or a box in the supermarket, which by the way, we should be doing, then we know when we see the sodium level is higher with something, we want to try to move towards something that's lower and so on where possible. And we have the good instructions now from countries in Europe that show if you go out and you put a public health policy in that says lower sodium and how many foods are served and when they're served in restaurants or in supermarkets, you can lower the blood pressure and therefore lower the cardiovascular risk by just lowering the sodium in there. Okay. And yeah, the exactly. last thing, of course, was the environmental factors, some of which you touched on already. Now, of course, we're in the year 2021, which means in 2020, we certainly saw the impact of racism and what happens is why Black Lives Matter took to the streets because everybody understood that having a situation where you live in constant fear and you have poor access to good, healthy foods indicates that you got the double hit in terms of environmental factors, bringing about an increase in blood pressure to stress, things like discrimination, things like poor diet. Best illustration I can give of that very quickly is we talked to a supermarket owner one time in Baltimore City about bringing better and healthier, lower sodium foods into the supermarket. And the first thing he said to us was, somebody told me about that two years ago. I tried it. After throwing about a thousand cans of the healthiest stuff away, I started going back to what I was doing before. So it takes a lot of education. That shows you how far we need to go. And just going to the supermarket and making the assumption you can buy healthy food is not an assumption we should make. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, this racism and discrimination, um, it's so subtle. Now, sometimes it's yes. blatant, but there's a mm -hmm. lot of it being subtle. And so unless yes. you're willing to understand that and recognize it, and then you have to put your coping skills in place because you're going to have to be able to handle it because it ain't going right. away. All right. No. I mean, we got folks is marching with tiki torches, except for they're so emboldened, they don't have hoods on. OK, so this right. thing is here. Uh, my grandma used to say from the cradle to the grave. All right? right, it is not going nowhere, and right. it does affect our blood pressure. I know this for a fact. For it, my brother had hypertension and high blood pressure for since his you know early uh, early twenties. He was a bus mm. driver in San Francisco. Mm. He mm. had he was on medications. Um, he had a doctor who did not control his blood pressure. His blood pressure mm. would be 160 over 94. And I would tell him mm. all the time, Walter, that pressure's too high. And he says, well, my doctor says that it's fine. And so I could never fine. get Fine, there's that word again, fine. <laughs> fine, right? And so he ended mm. up having a stroke. Right now, he can't mm. remember where he parks his car because his, his, mm. his memory is so bad, right? Mm. But he had to retire. And then mm. you know what happened to his blood pressure? It went down to normal. No mm -hmm. medications. In fact, mm -hmm. sometimes it goes low. So mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. that job he was working that was so stressful right. for him that that right. was the reason why his blood pressure mm -hmm. was so high. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, of course, as you know, the newest thing that's out on the marketplace, as you know, now that you say in the, in the environment, is now we have a new disparity to talk about, right, which is vaccination rates for COVID-19. So just when you think it's quote unquote safe to come out of the water and you got things moving in the right direction, you find that you got a whole nother thing. So now they have a whole divert. You probably know that President Biden has put together a whole, if you want to call it, disparities healthcare force now to try to find out ways to combat disparities. We now know that 500,000 people in New York City don't have good internet access. So what's happening to their kids in terms of getting to teach them for school and what's happening to them in terms of access to other things like finding out where the COVID vaccines are if you don't have internet access. Yep, and they make so. you sign up for the appointment online. So this, right. so that was why they did a really nice expose last night um, uh, on a, a clinic, a free clinic that was actually being run, well, actually it was a federally qualified health clinic in Los Angeles, mm. in Linwood, California, which is funny because I, you know, I, I used to do a lot of work in Linwood, California. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this clinic is run by an African-American epidemiologist mm -hmm. doctor, and he's allowing people to just walk up and stand in line mm -hmm. to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So no appointment mm -hmm. necessary. 
just mm-hmm. to deal with this. Linwood, California, evidently is one of the biggest hot pockets in L.A. Basin. And so this is why we have to think about mm-hmm. this. This health disparities, this racism, this not good access to care. Even if you have access to care, it's not, it's not the kind of care that is, you know, humane and culturally competent. So, yeah, no, we, we, got, we got a lot of, a lot of ways to go. So let's talk about risk factors. Risk factors yes. for hypertension. What are the risk factors that you see a lot of in your clinic? Yeah, the risk factors I see a lot of, of course, is the big one I'm starting out with that was obesity. And we know that when you start looking at, for example, African-American women and obesity, we find that the numbers are higher than other groups, even compared to African-American men. But the point I'm just trying to get at is that that's probably, if I had to pick one risk factor that I say everybody should remember, let's always remember that one obesity. The other one, some we touched on already, of course, we talked on the dietary consumption in terms of extra dietary consumption of salt. We talked also too about, and he touched on a little bit, you talked about how you have an expertise in diabetes education. Just becoming a diabetic for one reason or the other, also unfortunately would many times put you on the same train towards higher blood pressure that's outside of the normal range. So obesity, dietary factors. Of course, we talked a little bit before about the structural issues, i.e. racism, i.e. just the stress of living in a stressful environment that is a risk factor as well. And then the other thing we need to keep in mind is still in the back of our minds, we, even though I've kind of pushed it down a little bit, we still got to think about the genetic component. And we still got to think about the fact that as we think about the genetic component, we're getting more and more information as that comes to light. But these are the major risk factors that we see, the obesity, the environmental factors we talked about, to lower degree genetics, and of course, we talked about, of course, the big one, in addition in the diet, of course, being salt sensitivity. Yeah. Um, I, in Baltimore, how many folks are still smoking? Because that is another thing that we see. At, oh, at yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, American I mean, even that's a whole, I, you know, it's smoking the way I look at it. It's almost like not even just a risk factor. It's such a contributing factor to cardiovascular disease. I just call that almost a disease entity in and of itself. Okay. But in the Baltimore, the majority of people who smoke, unfortunately, still come from lower socioeconomic groups. And the majority of people who smoke tend to still be the same ones who go to, I see people do it all the time. I'm in line at the 7-Eleven, somebody buys a pack of cigarettes and also gets a hot dog. So it's the same 7-Eleven people go into and hit the two risk factors all at once, the cigarette plus the high salt intake all at the same time. And oh, not to mention the fact that you know, the candy that goes along with it in the bag. So that's a whole nother issue in and of itself. So yeah. we see that a lot. Mm-hmm. So to, just to let folks know in the audience, so when we're talking about decreasing your salt, we're talking about 2,000 milligrams a day. So you got to read your labels. Yes. You need to see how much salt or sodium, as Dr. Johnson said, is in mm-hmm. whatever it is you're about to consume. And you need to start adding it up. So you should not be cooking with salt. And anything that says salt in the name is salt. So onion salt, garlic salt, seasoning mm-hmm. salt, all of that is salt. So you gotta mm-hmm. take all of that out of your mm-hmm. diet and cook with herbs and spices. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. definitely every salt shaker needs to be thrown out of your house because you're not supposed to be salting your food at the table. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we gotta really focus on this salt because it does make you hold on to water. And we know that, mm-hmm. we said Dr. Johnson just talked about the inside passage. So everybody where the boat landed, that means the Caribbean, that means right. Europe, that means the United States, wherever the boat landed, they're all basically predisposed to this issue. So that's your number, folks. 2,000 milligrams is what we're, we're, we're looking at. So, okay, mm-hmm. so let's talk a little bit about medications. This is, you know, sure. I'm a pharmacist. This is what I do. I, I, no question and, about and it. I am mm-hmm. so, Dr. Johnson, I am so discouraged with the fact that with all of these new medications, all of these things, these nuances that we have that we didn't have when I started, you know, practice Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, we still are nowhere closer to having hypertension under control than we were back then. Um, And there's good data, studies, which have shown that African-Americans need at least two, if not more, medications. Can you talk about that for me and just talk about medication 
and and which ones you find to be the most effective so that we can make sure folks are on the right medicine. Well, first of all, again, when you go back to what you mentioned a minute ago, the 27 thing guidelines that brought about the number 130 over 80, a large percentage of those guidelines were talking about, of course, treatment. Now, let's go and start from the beginning, as you just said. What happens is that the people who, and when we talked about the guidelines, one of the reasons why they started talking about diuretics or water pills, if you want to call it that, and calcium channel blockers, the reason why these are often recommended as first-line therapy is because they're going to tend to have a greater bang for your buck. So in other words, it doesn't mean you can't use any blood pressure pill that's on the market, which you can, by the way, as long as it's effective. But if your blood pressure, for example, let's throw some real numbers out there. If you're a 60-year-old person and your blood pressure starts out at 160 over 100 and you don't pick a diuretic or calcium channel blocker somewhere at the beginning, it's probably going to take you longer to get to your goal blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 if you're already starting out at 160 over 100. So for African Americans who are often salt sensitive, that's one of the reasons why people started talking about diuretics, which promotes some salt unloading, if you will, as well as bringing down the blood pressure. So people would talk about when I would eat a lot of salt, I'll get swollen ankles, and therefore it made sense to think about a diuretic Or alternatively, if somebody cannot tolerate a diuretic, let's say you've got a job as an air traffic controller or something like that, where you certainly can't get up and run to the restroom every 15 minutes, calcium channel blockers are also very, very potent in terms of reducing blood pressure. So when you think about medications, you think about those when you need particularly what I call double-digit reductions in blood pressure. So if I need to go from 160 down to 130, I'm not going to get there probably without the help of either a diuretic and sometimes all of the above. Sometimes you have to use a diuretic plus a calcium channel block, even plus another agent right. to get to where you need to get to. But the important point about getting there is what? Getting there. Getting you got to get to that number to remember. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, I, I've been doing this for 40 years and nobody's on a water pill. And, and that is a mm-hmm. problem because you need just a little bit, just a little touch. Exactly. And what people mm-hmm. need to know is if you are going to the restroom every 10, 15 minutes, it means by definition you're eating too much salt in your diet. Because if right, you decrease right. the salt out of your diet, you won't be having to use the restroom so frequently. And mm-hmm. that effect actually, after a few months, it actually gets better. So I know yes. people don't want their doctors to give them the water pill and they don't take them, but that's why we're not getting to our numbers that we need to get to. Mm-hmm. So it's right. really, and really important. So, you know, so um, amlodipine is one of the calcium channel blockers. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a lot of others that are out there. They usually end with peen, the generic name. Right, um, right, so right. We, you, those have been, the studies have been done that show that those agents work very well in African-Americans. There are some ACE inhibitors and ARBs. That's the next class, right? That yes, mm-hmm. um, we have people take um, the ACE inhibitors. Uh, their last name ends with Pril, so Captopril, Ramapril. Right. All of those are, are um, ACE inhibitors, but they cause cough. Right. So a lot of patients don't like the coughing. So the doctor can switch you to an ARB. But what, right. I wanted you to talk about the fact that those agents don't seem to decrease blood pressure as well. Right. Well, I'm glad you talked about the ARBs. That's perfect timing because ARBs, by the way, if you don't know already, they end in sartan, you know, so like they'll say low sartan, yes. you know, and that kind of thing. So that's an example of an ARB, an angiotensin receptor blocker. But the point that we need to keep in mind is that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, the so-called sartans, like low sartan being the best example, that's probably one most people take, for example. Yeah. They need to help to get you to that number to remember. In other words, if you use low sartan by itself, the chances of you getting a greater than 10 point reduction in your blood pressure are very, very slow. And even as you try to take the drugs and you try to move them up to their maximal doses, you don't find that they tend to move the blood pressure very much after you get above a certain dose. So even if you double the dose of a certain medication, like for example, low sartan, I have to tell my students and residents this all the time, just doubling the dose is not gonna mean you're gonna get a double effect. It's right. gonna be a small bump and your blood pressure. So that's coming back again. When I use the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers we're talking about, I'm trying to get a twofold benefit. I'm trying to one, 
get a little bit of benefit on the blood pressure, but two, I'm trying to use things that are going to be what? Heart friendly and kidney friendly. So I'm using the pills for more than just a pill to lower the blood pressure. I'm using them because I want them to lower the blood pressure and bring about lesser dialysis and bring about fewer heart attacks and bring about fewer strokes. Because if I can do those three things, that's really what I'm trying to do that's going to increase the person's quality of life as well as quantity of life in many cases as well. So keep in mind drugs like that. Same thing with the drugs. I'll use another quick example, the drugs called the alpha blockers, which are now mostly used by urologists, like men who come in and say they have a big prostate. They will find they have a big prostate and give them a quote unquote alpha blockers. These are big black drugs like doxycycline is one, for example, that yeah. quickly comes to mind. Now you have to keep in mind when he's giving you that drug for your large prostate, it may help the blood pressure a little, but very doubtful that blood pressure pill by itself certainly it's not going to get you from 160 over 100 down to 130 over 80. No. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. So we got to keep that in mind. Yep. Same thing with the drugs, beta blockers. Beta blockers now tend to be used more for other reasons than blood pressure. In fact, if you go to England, for example, the UK as they call it, but if you go to England, they just basically pretty much have taken the beta blockers out of their recommendations when they write their hypertension guidelines. They basically mm-hmm. say, the beta blockers should be thought of of drugs to be used in conjunction with another agent for blood pressure, with the beta blockers being what? Heart friendly in many situations. So they're thinking of it as being a heart friendly drug as opposed to just a blood pressure drug, which I think makes sense from a lot of different perspectives, you know. So we gotta keep all these things in mind. And again, you touched on a major issue a minute ago. In many cases, some of these blood pressure medications can cause what? some degree of fluid retention. Yes. And therefore, if it makes your body hang on to fluid, the way you often get rid of it is by use of a diuretic. So patients who don't pill. know it already, one of the things you can do when you get up on that scale, when I see people who are getting up on the scale and the weight is going up and the ankles are getting going up as well, so when your ankles are getting bigger and when your weight on your scale is getting bigger simultaneously, that pretty much is screaming out for thinking about some kind of a diuretic for reduction in blood pressure. It tries to serve two purposes. Try to unload some of that fluid because we don't want our body taking too much fluid on at one time. And number two, also bringing the body to blood pressure reduction simultaneously. Right, right, right. So, you know, I, I've been at this a long time. And so what, what you just said is so important. So now we're doing sort of, we're doing combinations of drugs based upon what kind of other diseases you may have. So you mentioned the ACE yes. inhibitors and the ARBs are used in diabetics that have hypertension because they can be protective to the kidneys. Your beta blockers right. are used in people with heart failure and hypertension because they mm-hmm. find that they work very well in those patients. So I want people to call Healing Our Village, please. Let me make sure that you're on the right combination of medications for you. This is not a one size fits all situation. It used to be when we didn't have choices, but we have choices now. And so we need to be doing a better job of getting people on the right combination, but also at the right doses. So that they're not there because a lot of times we don't increase the doses up high enough to get to the number. So we're really trying to get to this 130 over 80 and we're not getting there. We're not even getting close to that number. Right. And so Mm -hmm. I know that at your clinic, you pride yourself in being able to hit your goals, your goal numbers. And everybody out there needs to know that the goal for blood pressure is 130 over 80. They know that I've talked all the time about the goal for A1C and diabetes is 7 to 7.5, depending on who you are. So let us help you get to goal. I think that is so, so important. Um, I want to ask another question. I want to talk about um, what tricks you use to get people to take their medicines. You got any tricks of the trade? Because I know that people don't want to take their medicines. I know. Well, the first thing I tell people all the time, and I guess I just need to be very blunt with the men, for example, because the men always have the same thing. They tell me, if I take that blood pressure pill, it's going to wake me directly to erectile dysfunction. Yes. And once I got that, so I tell people, and I told a group of men this, and I want people to hear this very carefully, and nothing will stop your stroke worse than a stroke. Think about that for a second. 
nothing will stop your stroke like a stroke. So when you think about erectile dysfunction, you got to think about the fact that when you go out there and you start thinking about medications, you have to be able to be in good health in order to have good erectile function. So one of the things which blood pressure pills helps to facilitate is it helps to facilitate us being healthier overall. Right. And therefore, when you're healthy overall, you can have a healthy, well-rounded life, including sexual function, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the tricks that I'll often will tell people is I'll tell people, listen, I want you to go on and try this medication. We're going to go at this with a positive attitude. And let's not think about erectile yeah. dysfunction yeah. for a second. Let's just go ahead and let's not even you know, go into it. We're just going to go on and we're just going to say, let's try it out. And I, if you give me my two sixty ninety day window, and if I can't get you, you know, to that point by that point, then we have another discussion. But let's at least get to that sixty to ninety day window. Number one, people like that. Number two, what I tell people all the time that's another important point to remember when people have what I call the anti medicine thought process. Right. A simple thing you can do, believe it or not, without even doing a study, and I know this from going to see because we just had uh, a number of times I've gone to the cemetery. Go to the cemetery and look at people who were living in the pre-medication era. Right. They didn't tend to live as long. No. So we got to keep in mind that these pills were terrible like people think they are. People wouldn't be living longer now than they were, say, when they were born in 1890 or 1880 and things of that nature. People didn't live long back then, no. particularly people of color. Right. So we got to keep in mind that one trick you got to keep in the back of your mind is let people know that people tend to be around longer. Then we got the second issue that comes up that I always have to do my negotiation with was, you hit on it to some degree. People say, well, I'm going to find something natural right. that lowers my blood pressure. Right. And I'll say, okay, well, you can try some natural things if you would like, and I have no problem with you doing whatever if you want to use garlic or if you want to use something else or whatever. Some people, I tell people my things that I talk about, we have some data on hibiscus tea, for example. If people want to try hibiscus tea, want to do a plant-based uh, diet, that's great. But here's the thing that bottom line is I also follow a line from the great martial artist from many years ago. And Bruce Lee said a long time ago, he said, what's your martial art? He said, the one that works. So basically what I have to tell people is that if the blood pressure does not come down, it does not come down and you are still at increased risk. And then I have people tell me one of the other tricks I have to let everybody know was the worst part about blood pressure for many patients is not a fatal heart attack. People, if they have a fatal heart attack, they'll say, well, I was being called home anyway. That was going to happen anyway on that day. But short of that, what often happens is many times people do what? They have a stroke, wind up unable to care for themselves, right. unable to make decisions for themselves, and winding up spending whatever last years they have in their life debilitated and not able to function. That's what you're really, 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 really trying to avoid. Yeah. So I said, if you don't want to take your blood pressure medication, think it's going to make you live another 10 more years. Say to yourself, I wouldn't want to last, live my last five years with a stroke. Yeah, yeah. You That's know, I, I tell people all the time, and I'm, I'm dating myself here, but if you remember uh, Sanford and Son, you know, I always tell them, listen, oh, yeah. you need to pray for the big one. Because you mm -hmm. want to have the one that takes you out of here. If you're gonna have, if you're right. not gonna do what you need to do, and you just want to, mm -hmm. you know, roll the dice, then pray mm -hmm. for the big one. Because if you don't mm -hmm. have the big one and you have the stroke that keeps you right. here, then you're now right. a burden on yourself and your family, and your whole life is upside down. And so mm -hmm. that I think is so important. You said that. I, the other thing I wanted to throw in there because I always think about the the healthy tips. Five to ten percent loss of weight. If you can get down five to ten percent of your weight loss of whatever number you're at today, actually mm -hmm. can help bring your blood pressure down. Definitely, right. we talked about stopping smoking. That can bring your blood pressure down. Mm -hmm. All right, and also we talked about decreasing the stress. But you know, if you decrease your weight, it also increases your 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 sexual health, right? Yes. And your body mm -hmm. image, because a lot of your sexual ability to function is a lot of it's mental as well as physical. So there's mm -hmm. all sorts of good reasons to try to, you know, get get more exercise, um, more minutes, 150 minutes per week is what we recommend. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff goes goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now, I know you recommend that people use blood pressure cuffs at home if they can afford it. What, yes. what, where, where do you stand on that? Should they, do you think well, we first, should do that? And where do you, what do you tell Well, first them? of all, we got a lot of support on that. It was just recently an article, just actually still, I believe, electronically being published. 
it might actually be in front of it. It just came out. 408 patients were found to be divided up into different groups. One did home blood pressure. That means you just take the blood pressure home and write down the numbers that you get, like we were talking about earlier. A second group got the 24-hour blood pressure monitor, which is the one that specializes in my office when I put the blood pressure cuff on a person's arm on Monday and tell them to bring the blood pressure cuff back on Tuesday morning, and then we record the readings. And then the third group was the people who just did the standard office blood pressure measurements. So they said, well, let's see how these different methods compare to how the heart looks. In other words, which one seems to be directly related to what's happening to your heart? Because what people have to realize is that really high blood pressure that's uncontrolled will tend to have an impact on your heart. So they did some measures of overall the heart size or mass index, as they call it. And they found that the group that had the best overall performance were the group that had the home blood pressure monitoring correlated well or if associated itself well, if you will, with what was going on with the heart versus even the 24 hour blood pressure monitor or the ones where people had three, four, five, six, or nine office blood pressure readings. Okay. So what does that mean? Or what does that translate into for the average person? The bottom line is that you are at home with yourself. You modify your behavior based on information that you get. So the information that you get at home through your blood pressure monitor at home is gonna give you a lot more to work with. And we now have good evidence to show that it correlates well excuse me, with what's happening in your body. So keep in mind that when it comes to home blood pressure monitoring, I tell every single patient that comes into my office, please get a blood pressure monitor. If they can't afford one, I'll say, well, let's think about it. You drive a car, a lot of them will say yes. I said, well, whatever that car note was, I can get you a blood pressure cuff for cheaper than that one month car note. Oh, yeah. And when people think of it that way, they go, <laughs> you, oh, yeah, four. okay, let me think about that. You know, exactly. So I can get you a cuff. So I'm going to get you a blood pressure cuff, which probably, frankly, is going to outlast your car. You're going to probably need a new car before you need another blood pressure cuff because it starts exactly. breaking down and getting on your nerves and all that kind of good stuff. So we need to keep that in mind. So home blood pressure monitoring is absolutely essential. Yes. And now we're moving, of course, into the 21st century blood pressure monitoring. Now we're more and more we're kind of correlating the blood pressure cuff with different devices. Now you see people with wristwatches now, right? Right. To keep the blood pressure readings. So they come in, they can press the button on their watch and tell me what their blood pressure readings were for the last two to three days, so for example. So we know that's coming into play. But the point that's the take home point for everybody, and I have to use the pun. The take home point is to take the blood pressure kit home. <laughs> That's the take home point for today. Because when you take that blood pressure cuff home, it's going to give you access to a lot more readings. Yes. And the other important point that's very, very important to keep in mind is if you feel differently, you can keep a diary right now. And I had a headache on Tuesday and see whether or not the headache had anything to do with the blood pressure. Right. If you feel dizzy, you can say, well, I can go and take my blood pressure diary. I can correlate to dizziness with my blood pressure reading. Because sometimes people go out and they check and they say they feel dizzy. They check their blood pressure. Their blood pressure is perfectly normal. Let's say it's 130 over 81 in nose or a yeah. little less. And they think that it was because of their blood pressure why they were dizzy. I say, no, no. it wasn't your blood pressure why they were dizzy. Something else is going on. Something Maybe you missed else. a meal or something else more significant may be going on. But don't automatically mean think that. Every time you feel dizzy, it needs, I need to skip my pills for two days, which is what some people do. Right, so exactly. that's why the home blood pressure monitor is so important. It can take away the myth that every symptom that you have has to be related to your blood pressure reading because it does not have to be related. No, it doesn't. And so as you mm -hmm. know, I'm involved now with remote patient monitoring. Um, I actually, on my website, hovhealth.com, I have Bluetooth enabled blood pressure cuffs and blood glucose monitors. Mm -hmm. So if they, if anyone who gets those, we can actually work with you. You'll be able to see your numbers on your cell phone. I'll be able to see your numbers on the cloud. And then my pharmacist actually work with you to make sure we can get your numbers down. So ask your doctor about a remote patient monitoring. Every patient that has high blood pressure, in my opinion, needs to be on some type of platform of remote patient monitoring so mm -hmm. that we can, well, everybody knows their numbers. And these apps are amazing. The one that I'm working with, I can even do a video call right from the app. So I can call you, mm. right? If I see your number, right. I can call you right mm -hmm. then and say, hey, why mm -hmm. is your number so high? 
So I think mm -hmm. that, you know, this remote patient monitoring is so important. Again, it has to only be Bluetooth enabled meters. If you want more mm -hmm. information about that, again, 800-788-0941 is the Healing Our Village telephone number. Please give us a call and let us know. As I told you, the best time I think to take it is at eight o'clock at night when you're relaxing or, you mm -hmm. know, everything, you're, you're calm now. Mm -hmm. That's the best time to take it. And I just think that, you know, we need to use the technology, Dr. Johnson. We got it now, Yes, right? we do. Yes, we do. We got yeah, it. And what I was going to say on that same note real quickly is that what I often do in my practice, I'll tell people I want two readings that are really important. I'll often get a blood pressure reading first thing in the morning before they take their medication because I want to know if the pills are actually lasting for 24 hours and how does their effect. And yes. then the second blood pressure reading, you mentioned that one later in the evening around 8 o'clock after dinner, is important because most people take their blood pressure medication in the morning and you want to see when they're peaking, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours later, you want to see if they're peaking and the blood pressure pills should be very, very potent at that particular point in time. You should get a good reading. So if you find yourself never getting good readings at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., for example, you got to make some kind of switch or change because whatever you're doing is not effective. And I guess that brings me to the other issue about remote monitoring is very important too. If you see blood pressure numbers that are very, very high, let's say you get 200 over 100, you really have to be able to make an assessment at that particular point in time and sort of say to yourself, you know, do I need to get more urgent care for this? In other words, if you got a doctor's appointment that's coming up on April the 15th and you've got a blood pressure of 200 over 100 today, that's not acceptable to wait till April the 15th to do something. You've got to do something well before then. Exactly. And here's the bottom line also too, when it comes to the emergency room, we know the emergency rooms are really strapped right now, particularly you mentioned Los Angeles is a great example of that. But even still, even in today's COVID-19 era, if it's an emergency, it's an emergency. It's and an if emergency. you've got to go, you've got to go. Because the bottom line is that they're finding people at home. This happened in New York particularly on a very high frequency when they first had the COVID initial large impact. They were finding where paramedics were going to the households when somebody didn't come out for two or three days, just finding people, unfortunately, who had passed away at home, right. probably because they were afraid to go to the emergency room, afraid they were going to get COVID-19. And many of them, I'm sure, had cardiovascular symptoms. They had heart attack symptoms. They had stroke symptoms, but they were afraid to do anything. They said, oh, I'll take another aspirin or, oh, I'll take another blood pressure pill and I'll go lay down. And they unfortunately wind up passing away at home. So I always tell people, your body's pretty smart. Right. If you're saying the word emergency room in your head two and three times, it's probably time to go. Right. That's exactly what's going right. to happen. And you so know what? You your don't body's not going to tell you the word. To, right. Right. It's not going to tell you the word emergency room five times if you don't need to go. Usually exactly. your body's pretty smart. You need It'll to give listen. you the right hints you need to go ahead and just listen. So that's yeah. an important point too, even in this COVID era. So don't be so afraid of COVID-19 that you wind up having an untimely demise at home. We've seen that happen more than once or twice. Yeah, yeah. And you know, listen, I tell you, there are urgent cares all right. over the place. So you don't have mm -hmm. to feel like you got to go to the hospital ER. I mean, I right. submit to you that there are urgent cares almost everywhere in this country. So if exactly. you think you are having some kind of a, of a, of a heart attack or stroke, if mm -hmm. your blood pressure is mm -hmm. super high, then, you know, get your call Uber, right? You mm -hmm. get there to your closest mm -hmm. urgent care because they can at mm -hmm. least get that sometimes they can give you like maybe some uh nifedipine or something underneath your tongue there are things that they mm -hmm. can do there to get that especially that top number the systolic pressure right, get that right. number down so you mm -hmm. do not right. have a stroke you do not want right. to now have a stroke right now what we have to keep in mind <clears throat> excuse me is that if you feel like now you have a strong history let's say you've had a heart attack before and you feel like you're having another one in that case, then that's where you want to make the distinction between urgent care and 911. Because right. I really think I'm pretty sure I know what's going on. And I know this is going to be beyond the scope of urgent care. And I want to just go 911 and go directly there. So and I tell people, directly. usually your heart and comes. usually your body will tell you the right answer to the question. Yes. So people who contemplate too much about when to go to the emergency room or whatever, I find you usually make the wrong versus the right answer to the question right. when you do that, you know. So it's better to go with your instincts. You know, when in doubt, check it out. It's still a rule of thumb that I follow.
That's mm-hmm. right. When in doubt, check it out. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you got a lot of doubt, you got to check it out. Exactly. I love it. You know, and Dr. Nowadays, Johnson, I am so stay. happy that you came on today. I think we've covered yeah. this topic, um, and but mm-hmm. there's still questions out there. You know, I'm, sure. this is not a one and done for 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 healing our village. We're here for you. Use us. Mm-hmm. 800-788-0941. Um, you can subscribe to our channel. Um, we're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're communicating with everybody every day. I'm sending out recipes and healthy tips and all sorts of really cool things. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a diabetes education program now of online. We have a diabetes prevention program now online. I'm about to launch a diabetes prevention uh, mobile app that people will be able to use. Um, mm-hmm. So we're here to try to, you know, really make a difference in the health of, of the minorities out here. Um, closing thoughts. What do you, tell us what the, what the last, some, some closing thoughts for from you and all of your experience. Oh, yes. Yeah, I definitely got plenty of those. So closing thoughts. One, if you don't already have a blood pressure monitor, if you don't have one, you don't have all the information. So go get one. Go get Two, one. Know your number. Now we're talking about 130 over 80 is the number to remember, and that's your starting point. Three, you don't have to be out there on your own. Even if you're a grandmother or whatever, we all know you pretend to have grandchildren, and they love to go online. They love to play with your computer. If you got a computer sitting in the corner, you can get grandma's computer out and let the 10 or 12-year-old play with that and go on to healing our village pull that information up and get the good education from Dr. Coleman that you've been hearing about was that one. So those are things if I want to make sure that you remember you have internet access as long as you have a friend. If you've got a friend who's got internet access, you have internet access too. Make sure you have access to your blood pressure with your blood pressure cuff. Don't worry so much about the brand. The most important thing to do is to get started. And the other point to that is to take your blood pressure cuff into your physician's office, make sure it's accurate and make sure that the technique that you're using for the blood pressure cuff is appropriate as well. Wrong technique brings wrong numbers. So you got to keep that in mind too. And the last thing, if you didn't hear anything else I said today, that sodium label that's on the back, sodium and the salt are going to be the same thing essentially for when you look at those labels, take that can, turn it around, take that box, turn it around when you go to the supermarket and find out how much sodium is in that food. And when something says less sodium, Just remember, don't fall into the trap. Read and find out how much sodium is in each box, the high sodium box versus the low sodium box. Sometimes you'll find there's only five or 10 points difference, which really makes no difference at all. It allows them to tell you that it's a low sodium or less sodium product. So keep that in mind, as well as, like you said before, taking that salt shaker and putting it out, you know, not necessarily keeping that right on the table because we don't need any help finding salt. Believe me, the American diet it's plenty of salt in it already. Right. You don't have to find any salt in the salt shaker. Eighty percent of our dietary salt comes without the salt shaker. A lot of people don't know that. It comes from what's already in the bag or what's already in the can, particularly if you use a lot of microwave or instant foods. That's how they keep it up on the shelf so long. They right. preserve it with salt, right? So yeah, exactly. that's how it works. Salt and so we got to keep that in mind. Yeah. And yeah. please keep in mind, too, that with everything we said on this program, we want you to try to have some kind of healthcare access. You may not have the ability to get healthcare access directly for a physician for whatever reason, but you do at least have groups like Healing Our Village that are out there, which can at least give you some information that will help you get to A to Z in terms of what you need to do in terms of getting answers. And then of course, we still want everybody to go in and get some kind of regular healthcare access someplace. So if you don't have it, those are the people we wanna hear from because we need to get the message out there Health disparities are still alive and well in 2021. And if you don't have a doctor, you need one. And we want to know why you don't have one. We put a lot of money in this country into the healthcare system. Where is it going? And why is it going there? That's one of the reasons why we do programs like that. So that's another take home message. If you don't have a doctor, we want to hear from you. That's why they gave you those phone numbers earlier. And that's why you have that website to call and say, I don't have a doctor. What should I do? That kind of thing. Exactly. Oh, Mm -hmm. all right. Oh, my, this is so good. Thank you so much. And I'm going to let you go so you can enjoy the rest of your Saturday. And again, the audience out there, thank you for tuning in to For Your Health. Listen, when we talk about a topic, we're not playing around here. We're getting a deep, deep dive. We're getting in the mud. 
so you guys mm -hmm. understand what's going on. If you missed, uh, didn't understand something today, or you missed a certain point, you know, reach out to us. Um, you can chat with us. You can call, give us a call, 800-788-0941. Um, my, my latest hot website is hobhealth.com, and I just want to have you all go there and just talk to us. I will put you with a wellness coach or I'll put you with a pharmacist. We will get your medicine sorted out and we will make sure that we can stop hypertension. Remember, hashtag no more funerals. Thanks again yes. and we'll see you next week. It's a brand new morning, sun is shining.